let's start um, this webinar for the Parenchima project under the COST initiative. It is our real pleasure to, to host this webinar um, in the frame of working group number two, where we have to set up this platform to share not only medical images, but also algorithms. And what we wanted today is to put together all the information that you can find in giving platform to integrate all the all the algorithms and the data okay but first of all i would like more or less to set up the rules of this webinar and the rules are mainly that uh, all of you will be on mute and this is mainly because uh, echoes and non-desired sounds are generated if we leave the microphones open so in case you have any doubt or concern do not hesitate to just unmute you and ask uh, what you want and let's do it interactive, right? Okay, who we are? Uh, we are uh, Quibim. Quibim is a company which acronym uh, this stands for uh, Quantitative Imaging Biomarkers in Medicine. And we are mainly engineers. You can see in this, uh, the people you will see in this room. This is one of the Quibim uh, offices and here you have uh, mainly people working in the field of biomedical engineering and um, also computing engineering and biotechnology right and uh, as you will know also we are we are based in Valencia Valencia is in the east part of Spain and here we have uh, one of the biggest hospitals in the country it's the La Fe Polytechnics and University Hospital it has around 1,000 beds. It has uh, more than 9,000 employees. And our radiology department has around uh, 50 radiologists. We have seven CT scanners, five MR scanners, and we are generating a total of 3,000 examinations per day. So our company is a spin-off of this university hospital. And as you can imagine, we are very used to develop algorithms and integrate them in, in clinical practice and develop research projects with radiologists. And uh, it's a long time ago since uh, I founded the company in uh, 2012, together with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Marty Bonmati, who is the chairman of the radiology department of this hospital and a key opinion leader also in the field of MRI and radiology at an European level. So. Uh, Let's start. I think that's uh, all I wanted to say. Obviously, uh, it would be interesting if after this uh, webinar, if you feel that you would like to know more or to potentially deepen your knowledge in the integration and in the use of Kiwi platform, we are really open to welcome you in our offices as, for example, other colleagues from Parenchima Project have already been here performing kind of workshop on algorithm integration. So we would be really willing to, to welcome you here and to perform an on-site hands-on integration of, of algorithms, right? So all of you are invited. are invited to come here to Valencia. And you know that this can be funded with, with the cost uh, project. So we encourage you to do that, honestly. So let's uh, start with the presentation. The first I wanted to we show to you if this uh, works. Let me check. Okay. Is uh, that despite all the progress that we have in, in medical imaging, as you can imagine, we are still working a lot with the human naked eye. All of you know imaging biomarkers, especially in the context of this project. And all of you, I'm sure, that are very used to listen to, to this no significant findings are appreciated, right? And uh, what we want, especially in Kibin, where we are interested in imaging biomarkers and the whole parenchyma project is related to imaging biomarkers, although in chronic kidney disease, but imaging biomarkers in general, um, what we want is to move from that to move to measurements, right? So we understand that if we perform computational analysis to these images and we extract additional information based mainly on new metrics, new imaging biomarkers, 
we can help to diagnose and to detect and to evaluate treatment response of diseases that were not present or at least not uh, appreciable to the naked eye, right? One of our main motivations or a sentence that inspires the whole PIVIM team is that from Lord Kelvin saying that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, then you know something about it, right? So imagine if we are not measuring anything today. We are using workstations, okay? We are working already in a, I would say, IT environment, but we really need in radiology is a complete integration of imaging biomarkers in clinical practice and in clinical trial. So our mission as KIVIM is to improve humans' health by applying advanced and innovative computational analysis techniques to radiological images and we want to improve not only short-term clinical problems like diagnosis, detection, or treatment response evaluation, but also long-term problems in radiology, like, for example, finding new prognostic imaging biomarkers. And as you already know, uh, what is an imaging biomarker? Uh, we understand that in the end, we can summarize everything as to measure is to know. And we have to measure the images and we have to extract biomarkers if we want to know something about it. What we lack today is an, in a standardization of how these measurements and how these imaging biomarkers are extracted. And precisely, this is one of the cores of the Parenchyma project. So let's extract the different properties from different research groups and let's compare the variability depending on image acquisition on vendors and different uh, properties, right? One of the key advantages of KIVIM is that uh, we developed uh, some years ago what we understand as our stepwise methodology for imaging biomarkers development. And this stepwise methodology always starts from a clinical idea. And you can see in the left side of the slide that we always initiate any development with a clinical input. For us, this is the proof of concept. Then in the proof of mechanism, we decide, um, we propose what will be the relationship between the biomarker that we will design and the physiological or biological property that we will measure. And then we will start all the technical steps, image acquisition, image processing, image analysis, and finally the measurement. So in image acquisition, we will discuss on spatial resolution, on contrast, and characteristics of the scanners. Then in image processing, we will work mainly with the filters that we will use. What are the characteristics? Do we have to correct noise? Do we have to realign? Do we have to solve something? And after that, we will perform image analysis. So we will apply the algorithms or the models or probably AI tools that we have to extract new biomarkers. Finally, in the measurements part, we, what we do is we discuss whether we extract the mean value or the median or the percentiles. We understand that the statistics is a significantly important part. And what we do is to optimize this uh, approach, deciding what are the best statistics to provide. And finally, as you can see, it's very important to perform a proof of principle evaluation and to find potential biases according to gender or to for example, to the age, right? If we calculate some parameters that are biased, so we, we have to know them. And finally, what we will do is we will test the efficacy and effectiveness of the new biomarker. And finally, we will generate a structure report. Well, this stepwise methodology was integrated in the ESR statement on the stepwise development of imaging biomarkers. And after that, uh, we decided to create also uh, the first imaging biomarkers book specifying and how we have to develop and we have to clinically integrate imaging biomarkers. We are involved in the KIVA committees from the RSNA. We are also members of the board of the European Imaging Biomarkers Alliance. We are also inside at the European Institute of Biomedical Imaging Research. Our research group and KIVIM are regular members and also we have been recognized of one of the best projects under 35 years old by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, the five pillars of KIVIM are focused in the oncological, oncological part. So we are working with solid tumors and hematology in neurodegeneration, 
uh, working mainly with uh, structural properties and structural imaging biomarkers. Also in musculoskeletal and bone quantification. And finally, two very specific applications. One is liver, and we are focused in virtual biopsy in the liver. So we have metrics providing information on steatohepatitis, fat and iron concentrations, and we have validated this method against uh, biopsies. And finally, a COPD in lung. We know that diffuse lung disease is a very important issue nowadays. Uh, respiratory disease is uh, gaining importance in, in terms of emergency departments and also in global healthcare socioeconomic burden. And we have to incorporate new biomarkers to early detect uh, diseases like COPD. And in this way, uh, Kibim has also a patent in, in lung emphysema. Um, in house, what we do is also we develop algorithms based on AI, especially deep learning. And here we, we will have a session today on how deep learning is integrated in our platform. And you will see how you can use the different environments and the libraries. Okay. And for that, for example, we can develop automated pipelines to the extraction for the extraction of organs. Here we have an example of prostate, but we can work perfectly one uh, method or algorithms for the automated segmentation of kidney or any abdominal organ that we aim inside this uh, parenchyma project, right? This is also an example that we are not only working in segmentation with AI, but also in classification with AI. And we have also an integrated chest X-ray uh, screening or classifier that helps a lot our radiologists in the hospital because we are more mostly focused on providing an abnormality score, okay? Well, but this is mainly the science. We decided to put all this knowledge inside a web platform, a system that uh, can be accessed from anywhere, very intuitive, where researchers can plug in their own uh, algorithms, where users can upload imaging studies to perform the analysis, and where hospitals, clinical trial companies, or even education institutions can use this to share medical studies, to apply analysis algorithm, and to extract knowledge from the images. Because one of our mottos inside the company is that we want to convert images to data, right? And we think that Kibin Precision Platform is the best way to do that. So our platform is GDPR compliant, it has also a quality management system based on the ISO 13485, and it's also FDA 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. And you will find this in some parts of the platform that require from different interaction from the user. This is a fast overview of the architecture of the platform, although after my presentation, uh, Rafael uh, Hernandez, who is the CTO of Kibim, he will go into detail on this uh, presentation and I will, I will tell you the, the agenda of the next lectures in the end of this presentation. Also, we have toolkits to connect the cloud to hospital networks and to work mainly with dissociated data. And if you are interested, we can also discuss on that. And these are some screenshots of the platform, but you will see them today because you will have also a demo of the platform and this is uh, some, these are some of the nice functionalities that you will find inside, like our zero footprint, Daikon Viewer with NPR, 3D rendering, and uh, also these views, right, on how we can manage the different plugins that we integrate and the data miner module. This is, well, these are some of the reports that we generate. Um, you can find here some samples. These are brain, lung, vertebra reports. But uh, you can generate any kind of report, right? Because uh, there is a strategy based on templates that you can use. And probably you can even generate your own design for your reports. And this would be quite funny. These are the two main uh, legs, let's say, of the company. One is Kibim Care and one is Kibim, And the other one is uh, for projects are clinical trials, mainly called Kibim Trials. And we are mainly working with two business models nowadays. We work with local installations, that means we put all the system in a hospital, or we also offer the service, a kind of paper analysis, right? 
Some of the impact we have had, for example, this is uh, our company presenting the architecture in the European Congress of Radiology and uh, in our booth, which is uh, quite open. And what we would like is that all this wouldn't have been possible without the help of these uh, partners that we have nowadays and customers. So we are nowadays working with uh, different companies related to the pharmaceutical industry and also with different hospitals uh, worldwide and also, of course, research groups and research institutions and even some uh, research project like the Cost Parenchyma Initiative that we are very proud of uh, being part of it, right? Our track record uh, is this one, if you are interested. I mean, we became a spin-off company of uh, La Fe Hospital in 2014. Then we entered in Lanzadera Accelerator, which is one of the most important accelerators in Spain. And then we released the platform version one in 2016, and we raised funds, raised private funding for uh, improving our platform. Then in 2017, we received and we were awarded with um, Horizon 2020 project, especially an SME instrument phase two that helped us to keep working in the platform and keep improving it. And this year we filed for CE Mark and FDA clearance. And this uh, is thanks also to the big team and to the excellent team that we have in Kibim. These are mainly the full-time employees working nowadays uh, in the company. And also we have a magnific advisory board, uh, which is directed by my colleague, uh, Professor Marty Bomati, who co-founded the company. And you will find here several key opinion leaders, not only in the field of radiology, but also in the field of genomics, nuclear medicine, basic research, and clinical trials. As I mentioned at the beginning, we really welcome all of you to our offices if you want to do a quick internship here, doing some integration of algorithms or doing some collaborative projects or developments. We already initiated some uh, workshop uh, inside the Parenchyma project. We received uh, here uh, Felix Navarro from Malaga, and we were happy to be working together during a week on integration of new DCE MRI uh, algorithms, right? And uh, from now on, uh, what we will have is first a presentation of uh, Rafael Hernandez. He's the CTO of Kibim and will show you the first the architecture of the platform and how we conceive the platform. And after he will perform a demo of the different environments. Then we will move to Fabio Garcia, and he will discuss on how to integrate theoretically, from a theoretical perspective, the algorithms inside the platform, right? And he will show some slides. And after that, we will have a quick presentation of uh, Ana Jimenez and Rafael Lopez. They are mainly working in the field of AI, and uh, they will show you how you can integrate, for example, quick plugins based on TensorFlow and Keras within the platform. And well, in the final part, we will have a real hands-on, also performed by Fabio Garcia, where you will see how uh, with the code open and live, uh, we can integrate these uh, tools in the platform, right? So let me introduce you uh, all of them. So let's uh, put in front of the camera. So hi, everyone. I introduce hi. you. Rafael Hernandez, Fabio, Ana, and Rafael Lopez. So we are here to solve for your problems. If you have any doubts or concerns, please do not hesitate to ask, and we will see this uh, button over there just blinking. Okay. So well, I think we can move to the next uh, presentation. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you. So hi everyone. As Angel mentioned, I'm Rafael. I'm the CEO of the company. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. It's Thank you. So one of the, the requirements we detect in the beginnings of the project is that we need a software able to uh, host and manage all the plugins of the analysis models and also able to manage all the interaction between the user and the algorithm with a, with a user-friendly interface and easy to use. So because of that, we create uh, Premium Precision, which is a web-based platform 
that I'm going to present you because we think that have a, a overview and knowledge about how it works and how it is built is useful and important. So during my speech, uh, I would like to talk to you about the uh, evolution of the architecture from the beginnings to the uh, next steps. Also about the integration model that Fabio will go deeper uh, after me. About the user roles, I think this is important because uh, if different users have different roles, we see different features. So don't uh, hesitate about to uh, change your user roles if, if you think it's needed. And also about the data visualization, because at the end of the radiomics is focused on stack conclusions and data visualization is really useful and important for uh, start this kind of conclusions. So let's start about the evolution of the architecture. Okay, we started in 2016. Uh, this is uh, a schema, a, 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 a what, diagram about the architecture. Uh, this is our MVP architecture. And one of the principles that we think was important and, and we already have this uh, principle as part of our philosophy is it should be modular. We should be able to include new modules or replicate modules if they are not needed anymore. And I will talk about this modular architecture and all the modules available uh, nowadays. Um, one of the principles was also it should be able to have a cloud uh, infrastructure or local infrastructure. This is very, import very important because uh, in, in some um, environments, we should have a local infrastructure because the data of the patient should be local, can be in the cloud. But at some points in some uh, different environments, we should be able to connect different centers and work uh, all together. So uh, it should be in a local infrastructure. And the last point is that we don't want to create a um, uh, workstation environment. We would like to be able to connect different people and serve all the department, all the department or all the user in a project uh, with uh, only one license or one uh, one platform. So for that point, we create a server side, server client based philosophy. So as you can see on the right side, the modules uh, are uh, in the MVP, five different modules. The first one was the interface, which was built as a single page application and should be able to manage all the user interaction, so tables, grids, buttons, the downs, and so on. The interface is connected with the web server, uh, which is the module that we manage all the flow of the information between the plugins, the user, the database, and so on. And we also manage the security of the platform, okay? This part is uh, the one that checks the token system integrated in the web server. Uh, obviously, we need a database to store all the information of the inputs, outputs generated by the user or the uh, plugins. And also, we need to store information about the user, the sessions, the tokens, and so on. Uh, we need to store it. Obviously, we are managing a lot of information, a lot of image files, and we need to store these uh, image files. In the first uh, version, the MVP, we use the block storage because it's, it's the most accurate uh, the most, um, I would say, precise um, system to store out file information. It also provides a uh, task queue to uh, task all the different analysis that should be run. And also is able to connect direct directly with the client. This is important because the speed connection, the fast and the performance of the connection. And obviously, for the analysis, we need a computing part. Uh, this computer part is uh, basically a high performance computing that is able to analyze the images and return the uh, results to the web server that will store all the information in the database. You can see all the connections in the diagram. So, in 2017 and 2018, we have moved and, and reorganized all the architecture of the platform. As you can see, we have refactorized all the code on the, on the web server from Java to Node, and also the database from MySQL to MongoDB. This has, this has, this has have a huge impact in the performance and the stability of the platform. 
and nurse and MongoDB has increased the flexibility so we can uh, interact and create new modules easily. We have also created a new module called MUC, the Medical Imaging Universal Connector, which is uh, available to connect um, the PAX system, for example, with the platform or local solution with cloud solution and many other connections. Uh, so we have increased the features and the option of the platform. We have also a new feature, which is the horizontal scalability. We are able to have multiple platforms working with the same computing part. And you can see the, the diagram is quite similar, but there is a new blue line, which is the, the, the modules that we can replicate using the same computing part. We have also created a new toolbox, which is CLI toolbox, to be able to communicate all the analysis of the plugins with the uh, web server um, that, that cor correspond. So even using the same computing part, we have uh, separated uh, web servers and separated connections. Uh, we have a lot of new features, for example, the graph, the icon viewer, the audit model, and many others that I will uh, show you during the demo. And also we have a new change in our philosophy uh, which is the continuous integration philosophy that I will explain in a few slides. As you can see, the models on the right side keep the same. The only difference is that we have moved from blobs to files because the organization, organization and the structure uh, is, um, I would say, easier for developers to work with them. And the next uh, steps, and I would like to talk about the next steps because this is not a frozen development. We have not stopped, we have a lot of ideas, we have a lot of requirements, and we know that this um, software to be in a continuous uh, development. So if you have any future that you need, or you have any idea, please share this kind of information with us because uh, we are always looking for new futures, and always looking to improve of our software. Uh, anyway, in, in our short, uh, short period of time, we would like to have a vertical scalability. So we, will, we wouldn't need uh, to make the um, uh, analysis to wait because we will be able to run as much analysis as we need in parallel. We would like to integrate this uh, methodology of continuous integration in all the models, all the platforms, and only in the web part. For that point, we, we will need to dockerize the infrastructure. I will go a little bit um, deeper on this point. Uh, we would like also to automatize the testing and the deployments part, and it should be done on demand. And also, we have a new job scheduler able to manage and create new virtual machines, the lead virtual machines. And any other things on the map. So as you can see, on the right side, the models uh, have a, a new one, which is a test and release module that will be uh, the one uh, responsible of the continuous integration and the host of the job scheduler. And the computer part uh, should be dockerized. So with this dockerized system, we don't have a, a change running process. We will have only process, running on each machine. Okay, let's talk about the integration model. Let's talk about Joker, let's talk about uh, continuous deployment. There are uh, different philosophies to uh, talk about integration. Uh, here we have only three examples, okay? The first one, the blue one, is the continuous integration. It allows to uh, developers to move from development environment to application tests to integration tests in an uh, automatic way, okay? The developers don't have to uh, worry about the application tests and the integration tests. The second uh, possibility is the continuous delivery, which is similar, but also have the accept acceptance test. It's another step. And the last is the continuous deployment, which will allow the developers to move from a developer environment to production, without uh, any manual interaction. Everything should be automatized just to uh, ensure all the steps are running correctly. 
Obviously, things can go wrong. What's happening is something is not ready, it's not stable, it's not good enough. So for this, uh, I would like to uh, show you this uh, small picture where you can see that multiple developers can work with a repository of code that will trigger the continuous integration cycle. In this continuous integration, the code the software will be compiled, built, and tested. During those steps, something can go wrong. In this, um, this uh, point, um, a failed report will be sent to the developers to ask for correction. If everything passes, uh, a report can be sent to the developer anyway, and the developer will be able to test manually if anything is uh, if it's needed, needed, and if, if everything runs okay and, and the tester is agree with the results, can release and deploy the software. And this is how Kibin is uh, thinking about continuous integration. Okay, from the left side, you can see that multiple developers can write over a repository of code. In our case, our repository of code is GitHub. Uh, you can have different branches in GitHub. So the developers should work over dev. Dev is the branch uh, for development environment. Uh, don't have to be stable. It's just a place where developers can share the, their code and can recommend their code. Uh, when the <clears throat> dev branch is more or less stable, or the future is more or less uh, developed, can uh, pull the code to test. In test, you can actually test the software, test the code, and if everything runs as expected, it should be pushed to master. Master is where the uh, production-ready code should be stored, okay? From this point, an automatic process starts. As you can see, Jenkins is the solution, is the software, that we have choose to manage those steps. So Jenkins is, uh, will receive the web socket from GitHub, will download the code, will test the code, will build the optimized code for the production environment, will create the dockerized code, and, and will send this code to the Docker uh, registry. During those steps, uh, if any error uh, happens, uh, a report will be sent to the developers to correct it. If uh, everything is uh, run okay, the Docker registry will create the new Docker image, and this Docker image will be available to the high performance computing cluster to run. Okay, as you can see, uh, the uh, high performance computing cluster is host in Azure right now, and is able to create new virtual machines to load the Docker uh, image that correspond to the analysis, take the images from the storage, and run all the process, returning back the results to the platform, okay? So this is uh, the, the steps needed to integrate a new software into the platform. We will see this in, in a uh, hands-on uh, way with my college Fabio. So let's talk about a little bit about user roles. And this is important, as I said, because uh, if you have different user roles, you will be able to see different things and you will have different features available. So don't, don't uh, be away if you can see different things and ask us to change your user role if needed. The first one is the reader. Sometimes we need uh, radiologists or we need readers to go into our platform and analyze the images. In this uh, user role um, is not allowed to upload new images. It will only receive shared studies, but with these shared studies, they will be able to work, to visualize, analyze, and the owner of the shared studies will be also available to see the results of, of the work of the reader. The user, which is the, the foul role, that will be able to load images, share the images, repeat also shared uh, studies, and work visualize and analyze as the reader. We have also the research role. The research role is like a user role, but uh, he's also able to integrate or uh, edit plugins. He'll be able to uh, well, create new analysis modules, uh, modify modules, interact with the repository and all the steps that we have seen before, this kind of things. 
We have also the admin. Sometimes we need an administrator to manage, to coordinate, and be able to see all the information inside a project. So it's like a user uh, role, but able to access to all the information, okay? And obviously we need a super user, able to do anything in the platform, correct mistakes, and these kind of things. It's like a user, in fact, can upload images, share, work, create plugins, but it's also able to see other people's information and coordinate and uh, work as an administrator. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, about the data mining and the data visualization, I have included a small GIF in the, in the slices just to see you how it works, but I would like to show the web version, which is a little bit more interactive. Okay. Okay, here we are. So in this case, we have a rectal cancer uh, pack of analysis, that is set of rectal cancer. Uh, in columns, we can see different uh, biomarkers, different measurements that we have done. And in the rows, we can see different patients. As you can see, each uh, biomarker has two different, two small columns. This is because we have a uh, baseline and uh, second and a follow-up uh, analysis. Okay, and in this case, we are seeing only the, the, the value of the biomarker in the baseline and in the follow-up. Okay, but what can we do? So here, one of the <clears throat> first thing we can do is to, for example, short information. In an increase or decrease uh, way, we can also modify the visualization. In this case, for example, we can see uh, in the red color when the uh, value of the variable has been decreased, and in blue color we when it has increased. We have also lines and many others. Okay. Uh, we can also uh, delete some rows or columns, and also if we choose a uh, um, biomarker, we can clusterize the information depending on the value of these biomarkers. As you can see, here there is a cluster of uh, three patients, three patients, and uh, eight patients. And on the right side, we can see the correlation of the biomarkers that we have measured. So from the point of view of the radiomics, that we know that is increasing is, is important every day. Uh, this is the way we think that the, the track of the conclusions can be easily uh, understood. We can, think, we can do many other things. Uh, for example, I can choose not only one biomarker, but three different biomarkers, and in this case, the uh, clusterization of the information will be different, okay? This will be included in the uh, web platform that I'm going to show you right now. I would like to show you a user point of view, okay? As a researcher, we will have more features, uh, but uh, Fabio will talk about this feature later on. This uh, platform is available right now in the URL that you are seeing in the uh, address bar, okay? So uh, if you don't have your account yet, please uh, tell us to create your own account. When you log in, the first thing you will see is the project that you are involved. Right now, we have only two different projects. One is Parenchyma, which is a global project, and the other one is Genetic that we think is Useful, useful to share information or um, analyze anything which is not related with parenchyma. Well, but we know that can be also used, for example, for a study and spin label, uh, DTI, or any other project that we have. We can create like your box of, of information, okay, inside the web platform. So you don't have to uh, move from different uh, softwares because all the information will be stored just this one, okay? I will choose parenchyma, and when I choose a project, all the information that I will see 
is related with this product. Okay, I can move to any other at any, any moment, but right now the information is filtered by uh, this agent. If I change, for example, I will see different patients. Okay, the interface within is uh, quite simple. You have a, a navigation bar on the left side and an action bar on the right side. This action bar is useful because you have here uh, actions that we think are useful in any place of the platform. For example, the blood study button is available in any point of the platform. You can create a new workspace to start working uh, in two different tabs without uh, the need of login. And you have a small box to send us your doubts or comments. Okay, if you write something here and you send, uh, we will receive an email and we can uh, answer any doubt, comment, or uh, feature that you want to share with us. So, a starting point, we will need to upload new studies. Clicking on the button, we will see this small window, and we can choose, first of all, the um, project that we want to uh, upload the images, okay? And right now, we are working in parenchyma, so the one uh, uh, selected by default is parenchyma. Okay, when we have select, we can create or select a new subject. This is important because the uh, because the subject selected here will be this, this uh, information of this subject will be the information used to identify these uh, images, these files, and this uh, study in our platform. Okay, we will see in the fourth step the minimization, uh, and we will explain it a bit deeper. I can, for example, create a new one. Let's say page two one, and we can have also different time points. Okay, we can create new time points, and it will depend on the project. Okay, what we have to choose? Let's go. And um, I have here a folder. Oops, sorry, with some folders inside, and here they have some Daikon files and some other files, okay? I'm just gonna drag and drop this folder. The web browser is gonna read all the Daikon files, okay? And we will uh, show us the information and we'll, uh, we'll ignore all the files that are not Daikon files, okay? One, we have choose the Daikon files, Clicking on next, we will anonymize and identify the information. Uh, when I, once I click the anonymize and identify button, you will see that the subject, which right now is empty, will be overwritten by the information selected in the second step. Okay, and back um, headers will be also overwritten with the information selected in the second step. So because of that, it's so important to choose correctly the subject information because it will be the information that will identify the uh, study on the patient or the subject in, in the platform. Okay, once I click, as you can see, here now my patient is called subpage 01. We can also uh, include a, a data form. Uh, this is uh, useful because sometimes we need some information which is not included in the diagram header. For example, if the patient is smoker or any other uh, information that is not included by default in the Daikon header. So we can create a template here to uh, ask the user to load all the information that we need to analyze uh, the study. In this case, there is no data form needed. So clicking on next, we will go to the blood process. Okay. And uh, you can see here the progress of the blood. And once it's finished, I will see a small box just to sync the study to ensure I'm the one that has uploaded the images. I have to type my password again. And now we have a new study, a single acquisition time point, time point with this study, and we have here three buttons to, uh, to, to, um, to perform actions with this study. I have a quick preview where we have, where we can see all the series, okay? 
I can do load the information. Uh, Fabio will also talk about that a little bit deeper. Because, but basically, you can see the images of the Syria in the Deacon Viewer. You can upload the images, um, see the TPG images. But here, okay, I can see here. Sorry for the for the confusion. I will check it and what has happened. Uh, something probably related with the browser. Uh, but here I can see all the information related with the analysis. Okay, I can see the subject code, uh, my code in this project because sometimes each center will have different set codes, time points. I can add technical comments. Okay, I can add my own tasks, tags. So, for example, let's say custom um, tag. Okay, and also we have the uh, two uh, medical dictionaries available with uh, a thousand of terms. For example, let's say, as you see, uh, or you have to type four different characters. Uh, okay, let's start with Rallex. Can find anything related with Nero anyway. We can link studies. This is useful also because sometimes we have baseline of the data miner and follow up studies. So we can link studies just to let the platform uh, see it, know it, and uh, create um, analysis related with two different types. I can see the series. Okay. And see in the Dicon Viewer, I can see the list of. Uh, plugins that are running or finished and all the available plugins for each region okay so here we can see the list of analysis available in the platform and you can see they are organized by region so once i choose a region i can see the models available to run a new analysis that just clicking on start everything will run in the background and I will receive an email when, when everything is finished. So if I want to see the series, if you want to, to work with the images, we can uh, see the Deacon Viewer integrated in the web platform, okay? This is a pure um, HTML5 Deacon Viewer, and I can create ROIs, and you can see here, I have a list of uh, ROIs. In this case, I have a circle, a square, and an ellipse. I can see the basic information. I can modify it. Um, I can create new ones with these tools. And we have also integrated here uh, NPR and some tools uh, for um, see the semi automatic uh, segmentation available. Okay, in this case, there is no semi automatic segmentation available, but we can work with the information um, here and this uh, ROIs will be shared with the uh, plugins. So the plugins can uh, analyze a specific regions if the user choose them. As results, we can see here all the information that the analysis, that the plugin has struck. As you can see, in this image, the user has selected this region. This is the one that has been analyzed, okay? The histogram and different D values. And here you have all the quantitative information. As Angel mentioned, I have a report that can be downloaded and can be customized because it's based on uh, date templates. And in a few seconds, I have my PDF with the report of the analysis. Okay, I can download all the information, the report, I can download the uh, uh, measurements, the table in CSV format or XLS. And you have many other features like the list of studies, the list of queries. You can share the information from here, for example. I can share. Uh, but in fact, I think I have some information already shared. As you can see here, I have shared this study with Fabio, 
So he is uh, also available to see this study, which is mine, but I can share any other, just clicking on the one you want to share, okay? And some, as you can also share documentation, for example, protocols, information, manuals, whatever, just clicking on that new document, you can drag and drop files here, and other people in the project will be able to see and download those documents. You have the data mining part, the list of biomarkers, obviously, and the administration part, well, you have the biomarker form, which all the fields needed to create a new biomarker are stored, okay? Here, you can see that you have um, parameters that you can include, and if you create parameters in an analysis, you will see, for example, yeah, here uh, I can select the series I want to analyze. In this case, I only have one series, and I can choose the color map of the results. This is one example of the customization of the analysis, okay? So, from my point, that's all. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you have any doubt, please contact us and let, let us know. Uh, but from now, I will let my colleague Fabio to talk a little bit deeper about the platform and the interest. All right. Um, this will be the, let's say, the, the main part of the, of the webinar today, that is the explanation on plugins integrate, integration methodology. Because uh, as developers, we, we, uh, I, I, I would understand that now uh, a lot of questions pop up. For example, we've seen how the user can, can upload a new study, how the user can share their studies with, with uh, another user. But from the developer standpoint, we, we ask ourselves, OK, how my algorithm has to interact with those studies? How my algorithm has to return the results of the analysis to the platform? So uh, we will cover that in this part of the webinar. Uh, first, we'll, we'll talk about the input that, uh, that, that our algorithm is going to receive, the output that our algorithm has to generate. If, if our algorithm has to be structured in, in any kind of, of, of specific way for it to be able to work properly, and the communication that the algorithm has to, has to do with the platform. All right, so first talking about input, uh, this is what, what the user sees, okay? This is the, the user has uploaded a new study and, and, and the developer has to be sure that the, that the user can analyze that, that study with uh, the algorithm that, that, we, that we develop. All right, so the first thing is, how is this study structured in the platform? How, what is the hierarchy of folders, of files that we are going to find. This is the input folder structure after uploading a new study. It's, it's actually quite simple. If you see, the hierarchy only has three levels. That the top one is the patient, then the study, and then the series. That's it. And then inside the series, uh, the, the files for each series. Then uh, if we go to the, this first level of the hierarchy, we see that the patient is at the top, then the study, and then the series. Pretty easy. It's there, there's not a lot of mystery here. And then inside each series, we'll find the DICOM files, and we'll find some other files that we'll talk about, but if we take an overall look, it's just patient, study, series, DICOM files. That's it. Very easy. So what, what are we going to find in its, in its series folder? We'll find the origi original DICOM files uploaded by the user, and they are organized by study and series that we, we just saw. And then we also find a nifty one file for its series that uh, it's converted automatically by the system. Why we offer the, the possibility of using nifty files instead of DICOM files? Well, they might be easier to handle than the original DICOM files in the sense that, for example, if a study has 1,000 images, it will be much easier for our programming language to just read one sorted 3D image stack than uh, having to iterate over the 1,000 images uh, and uh, 
uh, sorting the images ourselves, etc., etc. So we give the the developers both options to use. You can simply use the DICOM files and you choose how how you want to use them, or you can use the Nifty One files with two extra files because as you as you know, the Nifty One file is is uh, is simpler than the DICOM file, and we might have. Uh, lost some information. So what do we do? We offer uh, the DICOM header in two, in two files. First, in the header.json, for, for those that are not familiar with the JSON uh, files, uh, files, it's a very easy to, to read uh, type of file for any programming language. Uh, it's, it doesn't even need to be parsed. It just has to be read by any programming language, and it's very easy to handle. So the header.json is the file that will contain the header, the header found in the first DICOM file of each series. So you will find all the header of uh, one uh, DICOM file in, in this header JSON. All right, this is an example. As you, as you can see, you can, for example, you can see the tag 2802, that is samples per pixel, or uh, 2830, 30, that is uh, pixel spacing. So you will have all the information here. But as you know, there are some uh, uh, headers that vary across the whole series. For example, if we're talking uh, about image patient position or uh, B value, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we cover that uh, with InfoJSON because there are cer uh, a certain plugins that we develop may require this kind of tags, for example, B value or, uh, I don't know, acquisition time or image position patient that we talked about. And this is all included in the in the InfoJSON file. And it's organized this way. As you can see, th there will be a structure for, e for each slice in the in the series that you will and you will find the image position patient for each image, uh, I don't know, the B value for each image if, if that's the case, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I see there's a question. I'm going to, to open it just a moment. Ah, okay, it's it's from it's from our part. Okay, nothing. So uh, moving on. Okay. So what happens? That's uh, that covers the input after the the user has uploaded the study. But what happens when the when the user uh, clicks on start analysis on the platform? Okay, there's a new sub, we will find a new subfolder called biomarker. And inside biomarker, there will be also the, uh, uh, the new subfolder uh, for the analysis, we will call, we call it the analysis folder. That is where the analysis.json file will be stored. And why is this important? If you take a look, it's simply this. Uh, in the, by the biomarker folder, hangs from the, from the series folder. And inside biomarker folder, there will be the analysis folder that will tell us, uh, which kind of analysis has been launched in the platform. Inside the analysis folder is the analysis.json file. This analysis.json file is the most, the single most important file beside the DICOM files that you will find in the, in the, as, as the input. Uh, to be able to analyze the study, you will simply need the analysis.json file and the DICOM files. You can forget about the nifty files, about the header.json, about the info.json. Those files are, are simply optional and are there for your convenience if you need to. It, 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 if you wish, if you wish to. But uh, the analysis.json is completely mandatory because you will find uh, several re relevant information uh, in this file that will be uh, uh, completely mandatory for the analysis. Okay, so what's in the analysis.json file and why is it so important? Because you will find, uh, mainly you will find the paths to the, to, the, uh, to the study folder, the paths to each series. So the analysis.json file will tell you where are the icon files? Where, where do I have to go to look for my files? And also, uh, if the user has uh, drawn a ROI in the viewer, uh, the ROI definitions that the user has drawn, there will be also included in the analysis.json file. So as you can see, uh, the analysis.json file is absolutely important, absolutely mandatory. And with icon files and analysis.json file, you have uh, the whole input covered, okay? This is, this is uh, the structure of the analysis.json file. It looks like there's a lot of information, and there is, but for us, for the developer of the algorithm, there's just three, three fields that are really important. The first is folder, 
that will tell us uh, where, where should I place my results. This is the folder where I should place my results. Then study folder, that is the analysis, that is the, the study folder where I, should, where I will find the study, where I will find the diagram files. And then finally is the, uh, the series structure. This structure, uh, we, will, we are going to take a look at it now, and it will give, give us a lot of information on the series. For example, uh, what is the folder of its series and the row definitions for its series. We can see it here. As I told you, as I told you just now, you will find the folder for its series and most important, the row definitions uh, that have been drawn in the viewer. You can see a lot of information here for its row, but it's, I promise you, it's actually very simple and we will take uh, uh, an example, we'll see an example now that we will clarify this, uh, all this information. And then finally, another field that is standard that is going to tell us if uh, this series has to be analyzed or not, because the, series, the user has selected it. For example, in this case, the user has selected that the axial lava multiphase series is the DC series that has to be analyzed, for example, for a pharmacokinetic modeling uh, analysis. So, okay, uh, we see a lot of information of the row here, for example, position, label, text, ID, tension, points, name. So what, where does this information come from? From the viewer directly. Uh, label comes from the, the user, uh, can annotate the label if, if he wishes to, and also can introduce more information in the description field. Also, the, the points come directly from the, from the geometric points that define the row, and finally the shape of the row that the user chooses. He can choose a rectangle, an ellipse, a free form, or a spline. I will take a look, a look at, it, uh, at it in a moment. So now that we know where this information comes from, we are going to take a look at uh, a bit in, in, in detail at uh, these fields. The first one is position that will tell us the image position patient tag of the daikon slice where the row has been drawn, okay? So this is important for us to know which slice should I analyze. Then the, then the label that, they, as I told you, and uh, that the user has to option to, to annotate the, the ROI, also text that we, are so, that we just saw now. And there's a very important field that is the ROI identifier. This is important because this will univoc univocally uh, identify the ROI and will let, uh, uh, will let us know uh, when we uh, return the results, where should we place the results? Because for example, if there are three ROIs inside the results folder, there will be three new uh, subfolders with the, uh, that will be named with the ROI ID. So this field is, is very important. Then, uh, sorry, then uh, the next point is tension that is not used, uh, that is not needed uh, for the analysis. So you can, you can forget about it. And then you see 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. This will define the geometric shape of the ROI. And we will take a look at it in a moment. And then finally, is the type of the row that will be that will be used. It can be rectangle, uh, leaves, preform, or spline. All right. So why is lab label important? Because, for example, if we are going to analyze a DCE study, you know, for uh, pharmacokinetic modeling, we might want or we might have uh, an automatic AIF uh, detection in our algorithm. But uh, what if uh, we want to let the user uh, define manually the AIF. Then with this kind of system we can, if we, if, uh, for example, we, we not, not, not mandate, but we ask the user to, uh, to select an AIF besides, uh, you know, the ROI that has to be analyzed. So as you can see, the, the system gives us a lot of flexibility and power in this sense. And which kind of ROIs do we have? The first one is, is as you can see, I, I uh, we introduced the rows here with those 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 that you saw before, and we are going to define these points and what do they mean. The first one is the rectangle, and 0.1 and 0.2 will mark the top left corner of the rectangle, and 0.3 and 0.4 will mark the, the rectangle width and the rectangle head. Then it's ellipse. In this case, the 0.1 and 0.2 uh, mark the, the center of the ellipse, and 0.3 and 0.4 uh, the semi-axis of the, of the ellipse. Then spline that it's basically based on Bezier curves. Uh, it's, it gives us uh, point one is sp uh, spline points in, points in in pairs of coordinates that also include the control points. And point two will define those control points, those those green bubbles that you see in the figure. 
uh, those are the control points. Uh, you have a very nice link here in Wolfram Alpha uh, defining what's a Bezier curve. But uh, even if uh, it looks like this will be very hard to, to read and stuff, don't worry because uh, uh, Quibin can share code to read all these rows, to read all these files. So it will be much easier for you guys if you want to, to simply forget about the input and the output and just focus on your algorithm. You will, we will share MATLAB code uh, that will help you greatly uh, to read this, this kind of figures. Finally, the, the last one is very easy. It's free form. It's just uh, points in coordinate pairs, x, y. So it's, it's very self-explanatory. All right, as we can see, so summarizing the input as we, you know, as we just saw is flexible and is quite powerful, but it's simple. With analysis.json and the DICOM files, you're ready to take on the work. You can, and what we mean with this, that you don't need anything else to, to analyze your, the, the study and to use your algorithm. You, uh, you can use the nifty uh, file, the header.json, the info.json if you want to, but this is optional. It's just in case uh, you don't want to, uh, to iteratively read uh, 1,000 icon files in your code. The row definitions are available at the analysis.json file. That's, that's why the analysis.json file is so important. And it's, uh, you can find them in a very structured and easy to read manner, as it's a JSON file. It's very easy to read with any kind of programming language. And also in the analysis.json file, you will find the path uh, to any uh, file or folder that you need for the analysis. Finally, as I just told you, Kevin will share any uh, MATLAB code to read this kind of files, this kind of, uh, of uh, JSON files, DICOM files, etc. But it, it's, uh, it, it's, these are files that are quite easy to read in any programming language. For example, if you don't use MATLAB, it would be very easy for you to, to read them in, in, in any kind of language, as you are uh, surely accustomed to do. All right, so moving on to the output. Uh, we just saw what my algorithm is going to find, but OK, but what should I generate as results uh, for the platform uh, to understand my algorithm? All right, take a look at this and forget, and forget about it, because this is the output folder structure that looks very complicated, but it actually, it's actually very simple. Instead of taking a look at this this way, we will just focus it bit by bit. OK, so if you remember uh, when the user started a new analysis, this folder was created, the biomarker folder. And inside of it, we had the analysis folder. So these were uh, uh, folders that were created at the, uh, at the input. So what does my algorithm has to generate? My algorithm only has to generate these two folders, report and results. That's it. This, this is where I'm going to store my results. The analysis.json, it's an input file, as we saw before. The report.jade is uh, the JTEMplate template for, for the structure report to be created. And this will be stored in your, in your code folder. So this will be copied automatically here. So you don't have to worry about it right now. And the stepwise.json is an optional file to be able to tell the platform about the state of the analysis. But as I told you, it's completely optional. So the only mandatory part is to create the report and the results folder. OK? So. What files we do we define here? Analysis.json that is already tell as an, as, is an input file. Stateway.json that is optional and is the file that will be created uh, by the analysis plugin to inform Quibin precision about the, the process of the analysis. And because this can be this can be this can look very nice in the platform. For example, you will give the, the user feedback about the state of the analysis in this in this manner. For example, Okay, now I'm generating the images for for row one. I'm uh, quantific I'm performing the quantification for the pharmacokinetic biomarkers of row three, and you give the, the, the user a lot of information. But uh, this include this introduces a bit of complexity in the code, not a lot. But for uh, I mean for the first uh, integrations, I would recommend to to forget about stepwise and just focus on, on being able to return uh, the results correctly. Okay, and then the report.j that as I told you is, is the reporting plate in J language that is basically HTML uh, for, for us to be able to create the structure report. So this report.j is, as I told you, is basically HTML. That means it's basically tables. It's uh, a very easy language and we will share this, this kind of, of uh, templates with you. 
uh, for you to be able to modify them and to adapt them to your to your algorithm. Uh, these templates, even if they are very simple to to write, they are very powerful. They give us the option to to create this kind of of structure reports. As you can see, they give us a lot of flexibility in this sense, and we can create a lot of different uh, kind of uh, structure reports. But they are basically, if you take a look, there are tables, images, and that's that. So as as soon as you create your first uh, uh, J template, you will know how to create. Uh, all of them, so it's it's quite easy. All right, so we are going to talk about those two folders that we that we mentioned before. The first is a report folder, and why do we have two different folders? Report folder uh, will contain all the content needed for the creation of the quantification structure report, including images and numeric results in an XML file called report.xml. So with report folder, we'll create this kind of report. It will allow the platform to create this kind of report. And sorry, I move the, the mouse with my fat pad. And uh, then results folder will contain all the content needed for the storage of the results in the database of Quibin Precision. Again, including images and numeric results in a new XML file called result.xml. So What's inside the report folder? As I told you before, the report folder is, uh, has this kind of structure. From uh, imagine that the viewer has, draw, has drawn uh, three rows, such in this case. So inside the report folder, we'll find, we'll find a folder for each row, and that will have the name of the row ID. That's, that's, why, that's why I told you it was important. As you can see, the second folder is, is called with the, with the report folder with the name of the ROI, and we will find uh, all this information uh, inside the, the report folder. So, and also the report.xml file. So we, what we will find inside the ROI folders, if any ROI has been drawn in the viewer, the analysis plan has to create one folder for each ROI, containing an images subfolder with the images needed for the creation of the structure report. So in that folder, we'll put the only the images that we want uh, to, uh, to put in the structure report, okay? And then the report.xml is the file that with all the numeric data extracted from the analysis for our work. Okay, this file uh, has this structure. This is uh, the output file that will tell the report which numeric data has to be in it, okay? It has the top level of the hierarchy that is biomarker, then two optional fields. This is just for traceability sake, if you want to, to add them, because it will give you patient data, it will give you identifier of the analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not mandatory. The mandatory part is these structures that we see at the bottom. That is the analysis report. We have one structure for each ROI with the numeric results and the paths uh, to images of the analysis. Okay, if we open that analysis report structure, this is what we'll find. First, we'll find a structure called ROI info that is for the identification of the ROI. This is for the platform to know uh, which ROI uh, his, the platform is reading and where should he take those results and put those results. So it will give us the ID. The, we have to put it, the ID, the label, the text, and the name. Then a new structure called report images that will tell the platform uh, where to look for the path and, and the file name of the images. Very easy. And finally, a lesion structure that will contain the numeric results of the analysis. It's it's pretty simple. It's just zone. The first one, uh, the first uh, structure is zone for the anatomical zone. Then output for the variable uh, the variable identifier, as we define in the analysis plugin creation in Cubin Precision that we will take uh, a look later in the hands-on. Then the statistic that is the statistic identifier as defined in the analysis plugin creation form in Cubin Precision. And finally, the value of the, and that is the result of our biomarker. So in this example, we can see that, for example, the mean K-trans is 0.10. The mean, uh, sorry, the standard deviation for K-trans is 0.43, etc. It's very easy if you take, if you, you realize it's, it's very easy. All right, so that's the report. Now we'll, uh, the results folder that uh, I remember uh, I, I remember you that uh, it's used to feed the, the database of Cubin Precision. 
If you take a look, the structure is exactly the same as the report folder, one, uh, one subfolder for each row, and uh, a file called result.xml. So again, in the row, if uh, the row folders, if any row has been drawn, there will be a, a folder for each row, but the content will be a bit different that, than in the report. Because in the report folder, we only added the images that we wanted uh, for uh, to be in the report. But in the in the results of, in the results folder uh, for each row, we are going to add any image that we want. For example, if we have analyzed the whole volume for a DC analysis, I have my uh, my full uh, parametric maps for all the slices for K trans, for KEP, for B. You can add them here, and they will be and they will be uh, added to the platform. And you will be able to see all the series of images in the platform that, of course, couldn't fit in a one-page structure report, but that they are interesting for the user to have. And finally, the result.xml file that has the numeric data extracted from the analysis for all the rows, and but has a different structure than, than report.xml, and we'll take a look now. This is the result.xml. and it's very, very simple. We see biomarker at the highest level of the hierarchy, and then an identifier that is, again, optional for traceability sake. And then we'll have a zone structure for each one of the rows that were drawn in the viewer. This is the important part of the, of the result XML. We open that zone structure. This is the, what, we, what we'll find. These first fields, identifier, name, description, etc are all optional and they are only used for retrocompatibility with all versions of Kubin Precision. The first important part is the raw info that is exactly the same structure that we saw in, in the report.xml. And then uh, we'll have an output structure for each biomarker that we extracted from on the analysis with the number of results. If we open, as you see, it's a very similar structure to report.xml. We'll find identifier with the variable identifier, and then a structure for statistic with the identifier of the statistic and the value. For example, in this case, we have a 0.1 mean K trans, 0.43 standard deviation K trans, etc. Exactly as, as we did before. So, summarizing the output, uh, the thing that you have to remember is the report and results folder are mandatory uh, for Kubin Precision to know what to do with the results that do that. Uh, your algorithm generates. Then a row subfolder has to be created for the results of each row. And we will share Manda code to create the report.xml and result.xml files, and also to create the stateware.json to inform the platform of the current state of analysis. We can share all this Manda code with you. So, maybe, uh, for example, imagine that you don't use Manda, but you use a different programming language. This code will help, will help you to, to, to translate this to, to your, your original programming language. And of course, uh, we are here to help you and, and to have any hands-on here in Valencia if you want to come or any telco or whatever you want, okay? So I've, I've given you a lot of information, okay? But I want to do a brief summary of the input and the output uh, from, the, from the developer's perspective. Okay, so how does it work? How does it really work? My user has drawn through different rows in the viewer and has clicked on the start analysis and he expects to receive this kind of output, the, the, the structure report that we saw before. And this is what I want to give him. This is the, the kind of results that I want to give, him, to give him. So what do I have to take in mind, all right? Talking about the input, the first thing that I have to do is to read the analysis.json file to find out the path to the study, find out the path to each standard series uh, that means the, the series that have to be analyzed. And, we, and I'll find there the DICOM and 51 files. And it's at this point where I have to decide if I'm going to use the DICOM files or the nifty one plus header.json plus info.json. And then I have to find out the, the row definitions in analysis.json and, and use them in the analysis. With that, the input is solved. That's all I have to take into account. It's as simple as that. All right. Then, as since I have the input solved, I can do my algorithm, do its magic. Uh, I perform whatever uh, uh, operations operations they have I have to do within my algorithm, and that's it. 
And then when my algorithm finishes up the analysis, what should I do with the results? First, I have to write a report folder to let QEM Precision know which images and results should go in the structure report. I will take that, the platform will take that report.xml file and the report.js file that I told you about before, that is the template, and will create this kind of, of uh, structure report. Then I have to write the results folder to let QEM Precision know which images and results should go in the results view of the platform. So instead of the report, uh, sorry, this would be results uh, result.xml. The result.xml will feed the database for, uh, and that will allow us to see the results in this kind of, of view in the, in the platform, okay? So the user will see this kind of, of view with all the numeric of the, all the structured imaging biomarkers with the images, et cetera, et cetera. All right? So with that, we have the, the output. So, so, all right, input and output. But should I structure my code in any, in any way? Uh, what should I do in the middle of the input and the output? Do I have to, to do anything specific? Well, what do I have to do? Basically, whatever you want. It's, it's your choice. Uh, as long as you respect the input output structure, you're ready to go. Simply, uh, simply remember that where do you have to write the files and where should you put the results and you can do whatever you want in the middle. The simplest case, for example, is an analysis with no row need, for example, an FCM quantification. And also remember that as the programmer, you're entitled to specify user requirements and code your algorithm accordingly. For example, you can specify that your algorithm will need a row or that your algorithm will need no rows. And Inside the code, you can decide, all right, I will analyze all the rows uh, that the user has, has run in the viewer, no problem at all. Or I will just analyze one row at a time, et cetera, et cetera. That's your decision. So you can structure the code however you want. But uh, we at Quibin recommend some basic best practices regarding code structuring that, that we use, for example, in our, in, our, in our code, be it Python, be it MATLAB, uh, or whatever. Why? Because it's, it, it allows us to, to perform uh, a correct error handling and tracking, and it should really be considered. So what, how do we structure our code? We, we structure it in, in five tri-cut structures. These five uh, tri-cut uh, tri structures are first, uh, image reading and the analysis.json reading. The second is pre-processing, filtering, segmentation, whatever you want. Third, analysis. I'm going to analyze K-trans, to analyze ADC, to analyze, uh, I don't know, any uh, IBIM parameters, etc. Then image generation. I'm going to generate my parametric maps in this part. And finally, the result storage in, in Quibin Precision. And then catch, if anything goes wrong, I'm going to handle the errors, okay? So as you can see, th this is, for example, the basic structure in MATLAB is very, very, very easy. You can see this will be your function with your main function uh, and the five try, uh, try cuts statements. So if we open one of those statements, the first one, we'll find that in the try part, you will do your stuff. And in the catch part, we will take care of the error handling. This file error XML uh, is, uh, is a within uh, function that, of course, we can also share with you and we'll tell you the how it works in, in a minute. All right, so this will be the last part, this is the communication. We have everything now. We have the input, we have the, the output, we have generated our results. We know how to structure our code. So how do I communicate with the platform my results? How does the platform call my my algorithm, etc.? cetera? So what, what is communication needed? First, to call the analysis plugin from the, from the Quibin Precision platform. Then, to let Quibin Precision know that the analysis has finished successfully. To let, this is optional, to let Quibin Precision know the current state of the analysis, and to let Quibin Precision know that an execution error has occurred. That's why we have the error handling part. All right? So, first, Quibin Precision will call the analysis plugin through a very simple, very, very, very simple Windows script stored in a bat file. This, will be, this file will be stored in the code folder and will be programmed beforehand, but it's as simple as this. As this. You take a look, you have to say where your, your 
code folder is, and uh, that's it. You don't have to take uh, the, the rest of the bad file is, is, is done. So you just have to, to change that second line with the with uh, your uh, where your code folder will be stored. All right. Then if an analysis is successful, I have to perform a system call to the precision CLI app. Precision CLI acts as a proxy between your algorithm and the platform, and will let the platform know that the analysis has finished successfully. It's, it, you just have to perform this kind of, of, of uh, system call. And for example, in MATLAB, it looks like this. So when all your results are generated, you, just, you simply have to call uh, precision CLI with this line, and that's it, very easy. If an execution error happens, again, we have to call the precision CLI, CLI app, and there's no difference when, uh, from an execution error to a successful analysis. So how does uh, the platform uh, differentiate between a successful execution and an execution error? So if at the time of calling precision CLI, the system finds an XML file called archiveerror.xml in the analysis folder, it assumes that the execution has failed. This file is created at the cuts uh, of the try catch statement and we will provide the, the MATLAB function error XML that I told you before and it takes care of creating this, this file. What should be what should be the contents of this file? As long as, as that archival error.xml exists in the platform, it can be blank. You don't have to put anything. The platform will know that the, that the execution has failed. But it's extremely recommended for debugging pur uh, purposes and for uh, code development purposes uh, to fill it with useful info for tracking. Archiving, we, we fill it this way. For example, this, this is uh, one example of archival error.xml from a, a typical querying code. Uh, for example, the first line will be the ID error, that is the try statement that caused, that caused the error. Then we have ID error MATLAB, that is the error thrown by MATLAB. ID message MATLAB, that is the description of the error. ID function MATLAB, that will uh, tell us the function that caused the error. And finally, line MATLAB, that will tell us the, the line of the code that caused the error. And you see this is extremely, extremely useful for us uh, to debug the code and to, and to have information about why the analysis uh, failed. All right, so with that covered, the, the last part, and this is entirely optional, as I told you before, is uh, the state of the analysis. How do I communicate it to, uh, to, the, to the platform? Again, it's a system call to the precision CLI app, but with a different structure. Instead of precision CLI results, it's precision CLI stepwise. The rest is exactly the same, very easy. And, but as I told you, completely optional. At the time of calling precision CLI stepwise, the system expects a file called stepwise.json in the analysis folder. We will provide a MATLAB function that is uh, stepwise.json.m that takes care of creating this, this stepwise.json file. Stepwise.json.m requires a configuration file that is stepwise.config.json that we will also provide and that will define the approximate execution times of its try catch statement and the info shown to the user. This file should also be placed in the code folder and as I told you before, we can provide this, this file too. This will be the stepwise config.json. If you can see, it's, it's very, very simple. It's simply the times, uh, the approximate times that the developer estimates for its uh, try catch statement. Then the label for its try catch statement and the description, very easy. And then this is the stepwise.json that the platform will read. Will read. That is uh, basically structured this way. First, uh, the date, that is the ISO standard time and date. Then the label, which tries, uh, is, this is copied directly from a stepwise config.json and simply indicates which try catch statement is in, is in execution. Then the percent that indicates the completed analysis percentage, description, and time remaining, uh, estimated time remaining, of course. And uh, that's basically it from my part as, uh, for now. After part three, I will give you a little hands on with an integration of, of a simple algorithm, we we'll integrate an ADS, uh, a Gaussian uh, monoexponential algorithm for, for ADC quantification. And uh, as you will see, all these concepts will come down to earth and will have a very much, uh, a very clear uh, look at, uh, at, all this, at, at all this information.
If there's any questions, I, I will be glad to answer them. But if there are not, uh, my colleague Rafa will continue with part three. Is there Hello? Any, is there any question from the audience? Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, this is Shushmita from Leeds, uh, University of Leeds. So I have a question about the um, the MATLAB script for the try and catch you you have shown. Is yeah. this available for the user um, point of view or uh, users part or only for the developers? Right? Only for the developers. So, for example, if you want to develop an algorithm. Uh, Sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry, uh, Fabio, I cannot hear you properly. Can you hear me now, Sancita? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were talking about this script. Yes, yeah, yes. This this is only for the this is only for the developer. The user will see uh, the biomarkers in the platform as, as Rafael showed you before. So they okay. will, this will be transparent for them. They will only have to click on start analysis. The analysis will uh, okay. will be launched and they will receive the results. This is only okay. for developers, for you, for Felix, uh, for for people that is going to work in the project as a developer of algorithms. Okay. 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 We can, we can share all these files with you, uh, and we can, of course, uh, have any kind of of, me, of telco or whatever to go more in detail if you have any kind of doubts. But I think that with the hands-on that we are going to make in a in a minute. Uh, all these concepts will be will be a little bit clear, clearer because I know that there's a lot of information, but there are really just four or five important points that really have you really have to take into account to be able to integrate an algorithm. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Probably, uh, were you mentioning that because of you think it would be a good functionality for the user? Uh, again, if you come to the center, Angel, I'll be uh, able to hear you properly. Yeah, I was saying that uh, if you were making that uh, question because you think it would be an interesting feature. Or, or again, I'm losing you. <laughs> okay. I'm losing your voice. Okay. Uh, the question is that if you were making this question, no, related to the uh, try catch code. Because you think yeah, yeah. it would be an interesting quest, an interesting feature for the users, or we should keep it exclusively for the developers. I mean, I mean, if the users want to try um, different things, I mean that could complicate their experience also. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll be able to tell more if I try when I start using yeah. the biomarkers um as a user to like do analysis i guess but it could be helpful if for if it is open to the user i guess i mean but it could complicate stuff also i don't know yeah i mean what what you can do is you can share the if all over the working group too right because i, I think yeah. probably in the platform we could introduce uh, we could introduce a link that you could use to to download all the information. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. All the packets of files to convert from you know uh, from JSON to mask and, and vice versa, or whatever, and, and to include also the this kind of files. So we we'll, we'll, yes, yeah. we share through mail or if we put the algorithms in a, in the platform. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there more questions? No questions? No more questions? No. Okay. So yeah, yeah. let's move on. Hello, everybody. My name is Rafael Lopez, and I'm mainly working in deep learning. Uh, algorithms here at Quibim, and I'm going to explain for those of you who are working as well in specific, specifically segmentation algorithms, how uh, to integrate this kind of uh, algorithm, this kind of programs in our platform, uh, using mainly the, the uh, TensorFlow framework and the Keras API. Okay, so uh, the, the content of this speech is going to be a, a brief introduction to give you context about segmentation, then we're gonna go uh, to explain uh, a little bit 
uh, the tools that we use to, to develop these algorithms. And then we will speak about the particularities that these algorithms uh, have to be integrated in our platform that must be taken into account. Uh, and finally, we will speak about how to communicate uh, from Python the, the files that have, that have been explained before, how to communicate them to the platform. And finally, we will finish with a, with a little sample of how this works and uh, basically the, the workflow with a practical example. So uh, firstly, the, to introduce you a little bit about how this works, uh, as Fabio mentioned, we have uh, as input the analysis directory where we will find all the files that we need uh, for our program to work. And uh, after we are uh, passed all the information, we uh, can go to the image preprocessing and segmentation. Uh, we usually do this uh, procedure before the analysis methods in order to uh, provide these analysis methods with the regions of interest that want to be analyzed with them. Once the analysis methods obtain the quantitative information, we can uh, create the output files uh, and create like the structure report, for example, as we saw, and the results for the database of the platform. And well, uh, I guess uh, most of you know about it, but I'm just gonna give a brief explanation about segmentation, which is the segmentation algorithms allow us to uh, start with an input image and obtain finally a binary mask with pixels or voxels of the regions of interest in our image set to one and the rest of the regions of the image set to zero in order to be able to analyze particular regions of an image. Uh, autom uh, the automatization of the segmentation algorithms in the body uh, are a tricky task because uh, most of the body structures has high variability in shape, intensity and contrast in between different phases, different, uh, different acquisition methodologies, and so on. Because of that, uh, as I said, the autom uh, automating this task is quite complicated. But uh, thanks to deep learning methodologies and the proper data sets, the proper label data sets, uh, we have done breakthroughs in this area, and we are now able to, automatize, uh, to, automat to automate uh, segmentations of structures that were not able to be automated before. And uh, here we have uh, a fast example of, of implementation that we have done of segmentation. For instance, uh, we had an algorithm which was uh, no, uh, the calculation of nosologic maps in the prostate. But uh, since we needed previously to segment the prostate, uh, and before deep learning was not able to do it automatically, we needed to segment this area manually. But thanks now to the deep learning and uh, segmentation algorithms, automatic segmentation algorithms, we can just automate all the biomarker calculation of the nosological maps, for instance. Now we're going to speak about uh, the tools. Uh, our core tool, the framework that we're going to use to uh, make the deep learning algorithms run is TensorFlow. It's a very extended framework in industry and in research as well. And it's uh, an open source library for high performance numerical computation. Uh, one of its main advantages is that allows easy deployment across a variety of platforms. Uh, mainly this is interesting uh, because we can run it in CPU, GPU, and TPU. Uh, especially for training these algorithms, uh, it's a very high computing demand uh, phase, so we need to run it in, in GPUs because they have like a high trial computing power. Uh, one of the other advantages of TensorFlow is that it has a very, very, very strong support for machine learning and deep learning development. Uh, and it was like designed by Google engineers originally, so uh, it has a great community to support it. But uh, one of the problems of TensorFlow is that maybe the, the learning curve to it is sometimes quite high. It's quite difficult to develop, uh, to learn TensorFlow and to make experiments with it. So uh, what we use on top on, the, on TensorFlow is Keras, which is a high-level neural networks API written in Python. Keras allows us um, to accelerate much more our experimenting, our experimentation phase, because with much, much, much le uh, less lines of code, we can obtain the same results. And the, one of the motors of Keras that I think it's like uh, highlighting its functionality is that uh, being able to go from idea to results with the least possible delay is key to doing good research. Uh, another tool we use that is very convenient in our platform is Anaconda. Anaconda is an open source distribution uh, of Python for data science and machine learning applications. 
Uh, its main aim, the goal of uh, Anaconda is to simplify package management and deployment. So uh, it allows us easily to have a uh, several library uh, versions installed in different environments and, they, and there will be no conflicts. As well, it includes a desktop graphical user interface that allows to launch the applications and manage the, the packages and environments, which uh, we, it simplifies a lot and uh, it allows us to avoid like the command line if we want to do it in a more user-friendly way. And then uh, we think that the versions are really important because sometimes there can be a problem of, of understanding between different versions of different frameworks are, and software. So in our, in our platform, by the, uh, by the moment, we have installed Keras version 2.1.5, Python 3.5, TensorFlow 1.8, and Anaconda 4.4.1. Okay, uh, if you need uh, some specific version of, other, uh, of these libraries or maybe other dependencies, uh, just let us know and we will be able to create a new Anaconda environment for you in order you to experiment with, with your code. And now uh, the particularities of the integration of segmentation algorithms. Uh, there's not that much because we tried to, to make it uh, as uniform as we could. So there, there will not be a lot of differences between the normal analysis methods and segmentation methods. So in the bat file that is going to be used to launch the algorithm, we need firstly, before running our code, we need to activate the environment that contains the Anaconda environment that contains uh, the dependencies, the libraries that we mentioned before, that contains TensorFlow, that contains Keras, maybe OpenCV, maybe Nibable. So uh, all, the, all the libraries of Python that we need to to call our methods. And to activate the environment that we have created by now, we just need to run the code that you can see below called activate TensorFlow. That's all we need to do in our path file in addition uh, or in addition to the rest of the uh, analysis methods. Just activate the environment where our dependencies are. So, um, and, and in the input, the input files are exact, exactly the same and in the other analysis methods. So we have our analysis directory as input and then we will have uh, in, in there the analysis.json and the header.json files, and we can parse it as we do in the rest of analysis methodologies. And now uh, my colleague Anna is going to explain about uh, the details and examples about these outputs. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so in the previous talk, we have seen how to go from the viewer to uh, generate our uh, segmentation map. Now we are going to see how we can go from our uh, maps to the viewer in order to be able to visualize and edit them. We, we just have to, from our uh, binary maps, to generate a JSON file which is compatible with the Daikon Web Viewer, which is integrated with the platform. Um, I have to say that uh, we have already some code based on Python that uh, given a mask. A binary mask, we generate automatically this JSON file based on a splines representation. But for all of you that want to play with the colors, the different shapes that are available on the viewer, I'm going to explain a little bit the, the structure of this JSON file. Okay, this, uh, there are three main parts of this JSON file. First, uh, some um, properties related with the viewer state. There are some mandatory tasks and some optional tasks. The mandatory tasks are the version. Uh, nowadays, we are working on the version 0.3 on the viewer. And this is important because we need to have some um, scalability to the other version of the viewer. Then the other two mandatory uh, uh, properties are the drawings, which are directly the drawings that we want to uh, represent on the viewer. And then the drawing details, which are the basically the the labels associated to its drawing and the quantitative data if we, know, if we want to have some uh, related with each drawing. Then we, we have some optional property which are the window center and window width if we, if we want to change it from the, from the which is uh, stated on the viewer. The position if we want to go to a concrete slice when we load this JSON file. The scale and the scale center if we want to apply any zoom to the to the image and then a translation the same if we want to apply any translation to the image. 
Then we have uh, to specify which region is going to be segmented in order to, on the viewer, um, uh, select then uh, the region that we want to upload. These are uh, both in English and in Spanish. And finally, the JSON file. So here we have two different examples, one with both the mandatory and the optional uh, properties, another one with only the, the mandatory ones. If we want to go to the second one, we can see here one example that we have done for uh, liver segmentation, where we have specified the name, which is going to appear on the viewer, and also the uh, name of the JSON file that this file has. And then it's important to say that this file has to be saved on the series path of the image. And then we have here to generate a folder if it's not already generated called masks. And here in this folder, we have to store this JSON file. So according to the drawings uh, tag, we have um, we are going to find in this, in this section uh, three different uh, main parts. The first one is the, the drawing layer. Inside the drawing layer, we are going to find as much groups as layer with drawings we have. That means if we have a segmentation done on the liver from uh, the second slice to the 20th slice, then we, have, we are going to have uh, these uh, 18 uh, groups. And then on the ID of this group, the slice and the, or the frame is specified. Then on each group, we are going to find another group which is related with the drawing. Okay. Um, this in to this row we have to fix an identifier, which is important to say that we need one unique identifier for each drawing on the viewer. Okay. Inside this group associated to its shape, we are going to find uh, um, which is directly the shape. We have different shape that, as Fabio has said uh, previously, uh, Roy's plant based uh, shapes, uh, uh, ellipses, rectangles, circles. So this first um, part is related with the shape and then the, the level associated to, to the drawing. Okay? On the level, we have to say that uh, to all the, the drawings corresponding to the same segmentation, we have to establish the same level. So here we can see the different uh, uh, drawings that we have, the different shapes. First, we have uh, closed uh, regions, which are called lines. We have both those um, explain-based uh, regions. Then we have to specify them by stating the tension uh, characteristic to 0 0.5. Then we have the circle where we have to specify the x and y coordinates of the center and the radius. The ellipses where we have to specify the x and y center and both the x and y radius. And then the rectangle where we have to specify the x and y coordinates of the upper left uh, corner and also the width and the height. And finally, the drawing details, as I have said before, are related with the label and also quantitative data. Okay? We have to specify which is the identifier that this detail corresponds to which uh, shape. We can specify a long text, which is optional, we, where we can specify a description related to the ROI. Uh, then uh, the quant tag is related with quantitative data, but usually we set it to null because the viewer, when we upload the JSON file, we calculate automatically the, this quantitative data that we can find here in this, in this uh, image. And finally, we find the text S, where here is going to, is where we are going to fix the level associated to the drawing. Okay. And finally, as uh, on the analysis method, we have to communicate with the platform that our segmentation is with is ready to be visualized and read it. And we just have to uh, add this line of code to our main code, where we have to call Precision CLI in order to have this uh, segmentation available on the platform. And finally, we are going to see a tactical example in order, because I know it's a very rare case, and we, uh, I have to be sure that you know where these segmentations act inside the uh, 
the whole uh, flow. Okay. For example, uh, okay. Uh, here I have um, a segmentation already done. Okay, we can edit the, the segmentation by adding points, deleting them, moving the points, changing the levels. And here is where we upload the segmentations. In this list that we have seen is where is the name that we have fixed on the JSON file. And then when we have the, the segmentation ready, we just have to launch the analysis method. In this case, we have segmented the whole liver and we are launching a quantitative uh, liver fat and iron uh, quantification. So here we can see the results applied to each region that we have automat automatically calculated uh, by using the learning algorithms. So thank you. And if you have any question, I will try to help them. If not, I will continue with the hands on. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Are there questions now? We think it's a good moment, no? If there is any kind of concern to try to solve it. We see that there are around, uh, would be nine attendees minus giving people, no? So. Just to recap, we have been discussing no, first on the introduction of FIBIM. We have been having an overview on the company. Then Rafa Hernandez introduced the architecture of uh, all the platform. Then Fabio showed how to integrate um, plugins there in the platform. And now we were discussing with uh, Rafa and Anna about the plugins no, of AI solution. Oh, we have a, a message yeah, from... Hi, Murali. Uh, Murali from Mahayan Imaging. Mahayan is a collaborator of Kibin. It is a radiological company. It's actually, it's the most relevant radiological company in India. It's a private. Uh, Murari, do you have any questions? Okay, perfect. Good to see you. Welcome. Okay, in case you have any questions, do not hesitate, okay? Probably, uh, we can change now, uh, give us one or two minutes, no? Yeah. Fabio, just to prepare. And in case you have questions, now is the moment. After, in the hands-on, obviously we can discuss, but it will be mainly with uh, coding and really developing, okay? Thank you. Well, guys, I'm going to stop sharing the, the camera, okay? Because uh, we are going to focus only on the on the uh, screen on the on the code and how can we uh, integrate a, an algorithm okay so give me a minute okay and, and we'll start with that All right, guys. So I hope you hear me uh, correctly. I'm going to demonstrate uh, how to integrate a, a simple code 
we're going to integrate a, an ADC quantification code uh, in, uh, developed in MALDA. All right, first we're going to uh, to execute it in 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 this computer, and then we'll we'll uh, undergo the whole process of integrating the code in the platform. All right, if you see, I have uh, the study here. I have the uh, replicated the same the same structure of the code that we have in the in the platform. You will be able to download uh, the structure of the of the study in your computer from the platform. So you will be able to uh, for you to be able to develop your algorithms uh, with this with this structure of of images, of uh, DICOM files, Nifty files, uh, and JSON files. Okay. So you will be able to download this all this information from the from the platform. All right, so I have my study here and my biomarker folder here, uh, the the analysis folder, and then the analysis.json that is generated when when the user starts an, as, as an, an analysis. So as I told you before, the first thing that we have to to do is to read to read this analysis JSON. So we are going to take uh, this path and. This is for the the backing purposes. This is the code that we are going to execute. If you take a look, it, we are going to integrate a Gaussian monoexponential fitting of the of diffusion signal. So we are going to calculate ADC. And this for the parenchyma cost project, we are going to allow no or just one row uh, to be able to simplify the code and no stepwise uh, at this moment. So we are going to open those try cut statements one by one and and start analyzing the this code first in the in the computer right so i copy the the this will be the the path analysis will be the the path to to the analysis json file so if you i'm going to just evaluate the first statement okay so all right all right i have my keyboard now i'm going to open the first clause all right and we can see here the first step is simply reading that analysis JSON file. MATLAB can do it natively, but we use uh, uh, a library for MATLAB called JSON Lab that is very easy to use. And if you can see here that reading the, the that JSON file uh, with the load JSON function gives us this kind of, of, uh, of structure. Info analysis that has all the information from the analysis.json file in a MATLAB struct. So it's very, very easy to, as you, as you see, it's immediate to read these kind of files with MATLAB. It's very easy, and it's very easy also in any kind of programming language that you use for to program your algorithms, it's immediate. And as I told you before, the most important parts are folder and study folder, and of course, the series struct, where we have the, the series, in our case, we just have one that is called diffusion 044 slash four with the folder and in this case, the user draw one ROI, okay? With all this information. So as you can see, it's absolutely immediate to, to read this kind of files in MATLAB. I'm going to close all this and we are going to move on, all right? Then I'm going to load a Quivin color map that will make the images very nice and very colorful. I don't know if that's necessary or not, but we like this color map a lot. Then uh, I'm going to uh, in my code in your code you will have to define which are your which uh, standard series your your code expecting. All right, I have it. You can organize this however you want. We organize the uh, we, we create a new folder inside the code folder called the standard series with a JSON file that will tell me I'm expecting an, a diffusion MR, all right? And that's the standard name that the platform will recognize. Of course, all these, all these standard names uh, will be shared with, uh, with you and you will have all this information and uh, the code structure and, and everything you want, guys, about, about this. So I'm going to obtain the, the series mapping that is basically that, that uh, only that, the, the, the uh, is the the path to the to that file, and then red image is going to help us uh, read uh, read the nifty volume and the header, and also since we are going to use the nifty, we are also going to read the header 
uh, .json and the info.json. So I'm going to execute that image, all right? And I will have a new struct for raw data where I have the volume of the of the diffusion MR and also the header, the, the nifty, in this case, the, the nifty header here. All right, but as I told you, for example, in this case, we need the B the B values that are not stored in the nifty header. So that's why we read the header, uh, the header.json and the info.json. And the header, we have stored the header.json in the header DICOM structure here that uh, we have, as you see, all the, all the tags for the DICOM with all the values, all right? And we in the info they info DICOM struct we have one struct for each image of the of the series. In this case, there's 72 images, so we have uh, one struct with the tags that we decide. In this case, there will be B values, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for each image. All right, pretty simple up to now. All right, so now I'm going to execute this two function extract data header and extract data info uh, that will read uh, read Im, uh, information from the from the struct uh, structs that we uh, extracted before with uh, with uh, reading the json files in the study data we'll have study information basic study information and patient information for example pixel spacing uh, patient name if any patient id birth date etc etc and in data info, and that is the, the, most inter the most interesting of the two, we'll have, for example, in this case, we'll have the B values. Uh, just a moment, I'm going to open it. We'll have the B values, for example, in this case, is 0, 500, 1, 1, uh, 20, and uh, uh, 1,200, all right? So I will have uh, the length of the dynamic, and in this case is 18 slices with the image uh, patient position for each slice. And this is the code, uh, for example, for this code that we can share with you. All right, then uh, we are going to reorient the image and we are going to check if the B values are sorted because if you can, as you can see here, they are not sorted. This will take care, this, this uh, little snippet of code will take care of that and, and we'll uh, um, we'll uh, sort the B values and also we'll apply changes to the to the volume uh, accordingly to those changes that we made in the B values. All right. Now we're going to uh, with this function with Roy, we are going to read the definitions of the of the Roy's, and we are going to convert them into a binary mask that we can find here. As you can see, it's a mask with the same size as one of the dynamics in the acquisition, all right? And in which slice number the, the ROI was was uh, placed, right? So with that, we covered the first part that it was uh, image reading and analysis.json reading, all right? We have uh, all the information extracted now. So the uh, second try catch is data preprocessing. In this case, we are not going to make any kind of data preprocessing. We are not going to filter. We are going to with a very simple algorithm. So we are going to check if the number of rows is uh, bigger than zero, and if if it is, we uh, if it's zero, we are going to create a, a mask for the full volume. All right, it's uh, just an intermediate step, but nothing nothing of importance. Then we are open. The third try uh, catch statement that is the data analysis per se. We are going to, all right, we are going to extract the signals for the diffusion uh, volume. Uh, we can see the signals matrix here. As you can see, we have four B values. And so we have one value for each uh, B value of each pixel. And we have one signal for each pixel of the mask. Uh, that the user uh, draws. So in this case, we have 3,100 uh, signals, all right? Then we are going to initialize or initial solution or tolerances, et cetera, et cetera. And then we are going to analyze it. We analyze it with a compiled C++ code that we create, we, uh, we created to, for it to be very fast. In fact, the, the thing is slowing down the, the code here is this part four because it's going to start the parallel pool in MATLAB that takes around 
20, 20, 25 seconds, but the actual code is, is almost immediate. But in case, for example, that you have the whole volume, I mean, that you're going to analyze the whole volume, the part for here, here might, might help. So it's completed. And if we can see the time, it's 22 seconds. But since the parallel pool is started already, if we repeat the operation, now <laughs> the time is around 0 .0, 0 0.2 seconds. So it's really, really fast. All right. Now I'm going to, to go back to volume shape. And these are the uh, the slices that will contain the, the final results. Then I'm going to calculate the statistics. Uh, basically, what I'm going to store that is, for example, the mean, standard deviation, the median, uh, the per percentage 25, and percentage 20 75. This is what is going to end in the report and the database of Cubin Precision. Then we create this structure that is always called analysis, then the anatomical zone, then the variable that we are analyzing, and then the statistic. And with this structure, we'll we will create the report.xml and result.xml files. Uh, uh, as I told you, we will give you, uh, we will share code to create these files, but uh, of course, this is how we do, how we do things, but uh, you know, you have a lot of flexibility in this part. So you can uh, code uh, how, uh, however you want. All right, then the fourth part is going to be the generation of the XML files and the image storing. All right, since we force one row at most, uh, this flag will tell the, the analysis that this, there are no more rows to analyze. We are going to create the report. Uh, sorry. Uh, all right, I didn't, I didn't execute this part. All right, there you go. Uh, we are going to create the, the report uh, folder and the results folder. We are going to take a look, uh, just a moment, a look at it. All right, as you can see, they are being created uh, with the ROI already, the ROI folder inside of them, but no results as of, as of now, okay? So moving on, we are going to create the, the the result.xml file, and we are going to take a look at it. Here it is. We created it, and as uh, you can see, it's a very simple. As I told you before, it's a very simple structure. With the with the most important part is the zone because this 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 zone uh, will be one. Uh, sorry, there there will be one zone for its ROI with the ROI info and uh, the ADC value and uh, all, uh, uh, all the biomarkers that we have extracted in the analysis. All right, uh, next, uh, we will go to image storing. We are going to create the images in our analysis. So first, we are going to extract the parametric map of the ROI, and you have it here for ADC. Then uh, we are going to add these images to the report that is the the lower B value and the higher B value, and then the histogram of the values, okay? And then we are going to create images that are going to go in the results folder. In this case, we are only analyzing one slice, so the images in the results folder and the report folder will be exactly the same. And uh, finally, I'm going to create the report.xml file. And we are going, and with this, I have completed the analysis and I have all the results already here. As you can see, the images that are going to go into the report, the report.xml with the structure that we discussed before. Okay? So, all right. I know, now I know that my code works. Now I know that my code is able to replicate the structure of folders that the platform is expecting. So what do I have to do to add the code uh, to uh, Quillian Precision? All right. The first thing that I have to do is create a GitHub repository, all right? Uh, we will create these this repositories for you, as many as, as, as you need, all right? Uh, in this case, I, I call this one parenchyma test, all right? I have uh, it already cloned here. As you can see now, it's empty. And if we go to the, to the website, we see that the repository is empty. Now we are going to fill it up with, the, with our code, all right? So I'm going here to where I have my code, and I'm going to simply drag and drop it into our clone repository here. So 
I'm going to copy it. All right, that's it. And now the GitHub uh, app will have detected that new files have been added to the repository. Uh, it, uh, it's mandatory to add, a, you know, a, to, to commit the changes to, to the repository. We have to, to add a description that is, I'm going to say, Parenkima demo. That's it. And finally, we have to, to simply to fetch the origin. All right. And that should be already pushed to the to the repository. Let me check. No, uh, something I there's something I did. Ah, sorry. Yeah, I didn't I didn't actually commit because I, I didn't see the right. I'm committing to master. All right. And then I'm going to push to origin. All right, it's finishing. All right, and now we should have here, all right, all the code that we have uploaded to the repository to our master branch. Okay, perfect. Now we go to uh, Queen Precision. Uh, I'm going to go in with my with my account so I can show it to you the whole process. Oh, sorry. All right. Going in, I'm going to, for example, select gen generic, and I'm going to to upload the uh, upload the study. Okay. I'm going to say that this is going to generic. Uh, I'm going to use a patient that I already have here. I'm going to say that is for period two. All right, and now it's asking for the files. Uh, just let me open the study. All right. Sorry. Not here. Here. All right. Finish reading. Is what I wanted. Okay. Next. Anonymize and identify. Okay, since the patient was already created, the name will be the same. And now it's going to upload the, the, the study. All right, I have my Oh, okay, since it already exists on database, all right, it doesn't matter because I already have it here. Uh, this is this is very interesting because the platform is intelligent enough uh, so that if the images already exist for the patient, uh, they are not uploaded anymore. Since they are already here in the second time point, you don't have to upload them, upload them again. It will the system will not let you. All right now. I'm going to create the the biomarker, the biomarker. Let's say the analysis plugin in the platform, All right? So we can call it uh, Parenchyma Demo ADC, for example. I'm going to use the same name in English. Choose the image that we are going to use. I have the nice logo of. Uh, uh, well, I had. I had, I, I swear, I had the the nice logo of of, of Parenchyma in the. All right, just let me let me use an image. All right, we're going to use any kind of image because uh, it doesn't really matter right now. I'm going to use uh, the green logo, for example. All right. All right, and now uh, we are going to select an identifier. Uh, as an identifier, I, I would advise to use the same name as the repository that you, that you use. So in this case, it would be Parenchyma test, all right? Then the version, this will, will be version one, and the area in this case would be, for example, oncology. Mandatory row, you are going to select no. It's available and it's, it's integrated because it's already in the repository. Now the repository name is the same, Parenchyma test, that as you saw 
before in GitHub. Uh, all right, running my test, and that's it. This is the the file path to the bat uh, file that we talked about, and the, to the report template that is already in the report folder and, and on the code folder, and that I have already uploaded to the to the repository. All right, requirements will be uh, a diffusion MR. It's mandatory. There are no more, no more, no more series, so zero, zero, no mandatory series, and the acquisition modality will be MR. The application will be uh, ADC quantification. Now we'll do this for all of the fields. All right. And now we have to add the variables. In this case, uh, since it's ADC, well, we are going to be uh, calculating and the statistics that we show uh, uh, that we saw before in the in the report file so in this case we have adc mean now adc standard deviation oh sorry i didn't add sorry sorry adc mean mean no i add it all right now now that's i have added the mean now i i have to repeat it for Standard deviation, All right? Now, median, and now the percentiles. Right, we have the five biomarkers that we are going to extract, and we are not going to define optional parameters as of now. So I'm going to save our creation. All right, it's been saved successfully, and now I'm going to refresh the folder, refresh the, the screen, because we are going to go into it right now to be to see if we can fetch the code from the repository. All right. Refreshing. Yes. All right. Cool. Hi. Hi, guys. Internet. No está entrando en la plataforma. Just wait a moment because it looks like we are having trouble with the internet connection all right now so i'm going to log in again sorry I'm going back to generic. I'm going back to biomarker creation. Uh, and I'm going to look for the biomarker that we created. That is parenchyma demo ADC. All right. So I'm going, as you see, after we create the, the, the analysis method, we have these two new buttons that is going to allow me to fetch the code from the repository. And as you can see, this is the description that we introduced in GitHub in the in the in the commit B test parenchyma demo, and we have it here. As you can see, this means that the the platform has fetched the code correctly and has already deployed it in the production platform. All right. So now we update and we have everything we need ready to go. So we go to subjects uh, and we go to the case, the, the study that we wanted to analyze, right? Now I'm going to see the study. 
we are going to, to draw a roid. As soon as it loads, it loads uh, quite fast. Uh, as you see, all right. I have, yeah, all right. I have this one already drawn here, so that's the one we are going to to analyze. As you see, we have four V values, and we are going to analyze uh, that roid. All right. Uh, now it's simply a matter of starting. This is the the one that we created. And we have everything ready because we have already matched the series, the standard series with the, the name of the series. And we simply have to click on start analysis. All right. Now we have to, to wait a moment. It might take some uh, couple of minutes. As you see, it's, it stays, it's going to stay on processing because we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, implemented the stepwise methodology in this one, so it's not going to tell the platform about the state of the analysis only when it only when it ends. Just give it a couple of minutes, and it will end quite fast. Let's check. I'm going to, since we didn't implement the. Uh, all right, it's finished. You can see it here. Since we didn't implement the the, the stepwise methodology in this plugin, it wouldn't it wouldn't give us more information about the state of the analysis. But when it's finished, uh, it it will tell you so, and it will send the user an email telling him that the that the analysis has finished. As we can see, we can see the images that have been generated. Uh, and also we can download the structure report here. So as you can see, it took me about 20, 30 minutes to integrate a, a new algorithm. And uh, that's telling all the steps and stuff. As soon as you integrate your first algorithm, it will be very easy. You will have it uh, already learned. And you have in the slides all the information you need uh, to integrate a new algorithm. We'll, we also have the integration manual. Oh, OK. So No, the app is not. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's no questions, really. Do you have, guys, do you have any questions regarding the integration? This, this little hands-on. Uh, so uh, the steps I... that you uh, the, the steps that you just um, described uh, are they given in the user manual? Yes. Like, uh, um, the uh, from the last user manual that we sent you, uh, since it was precision, yeah, it, it, we sent it like six months ago. It we have changed, yes, yeah. and we have uh, as you can see the the GitHub repositories and all these new functionalities weren't weren't included because this is something that we have uh, uh, developed spe specifically for Parenchima, you know, for for okay. developers. <laughs> For developers of the Parenchima uh, uh, project to be able to integrate the, the code in an easy way uh, with no hassle, so uh, that that's new, and we will add it to the to the uh, integration manual, so you have all the information. All right. No, we received. Uh, you sent us a user manual in yeah. uh, May, yeah. and it so in, in last May. This yeah, year, but it has, it and has, that sorry, it doesn't have it, or it has. I 
No, we have to update it. Uh, to okay, it okay. With these last features, for example, from the GitHub code, and okay. all, we'll update it and send it. Okay, to okay, you. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think there was another question in background that was overlapped with Susmita. Uh, uh, hi, Fabio. This is Dr. Vasan here. Hi, uh, uh, Hi, how are you guys? Fine. Uh, so, so we kind of uh, joined a little late. So, yeah, uh, I presume that this uh, entire thing is that prostate nosological maps, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I mean, this can be used to generate nosological maps, but uh, since this was a main tutorial to show developers how to integrate algorithms, we decided to go just uh, with a very easy piece of which is the quantification of the apparent diffusion coefficient, right? But for okay. example, you can do a more complex piece of code with ADC, with KTRANS, with whatever biomarker, and then we can combine mm. all of them, right? As we do in the nosological mapping, right? Right. With multivariate right. analysis, yeah. I mean, this was kind of example on how you can integrate something, no? Now people oh. and developers in Parenchyma project, they do have, mm -hmm. uh, for example, T2 mapping, T1 mapping, uh, K-trans, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, because the project is on chronic kidney disease, right? And therefore it's, it's important that uh, inside this platform, we create kind of projects that cover all the main clinical needs in chronic kidney disease. They are working even with arterial spin labeling, no? which I think it's uh, extremely nice for, for kidney. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, we are reading your question. One second. So, are PrEP actions such as co registration, inter B value, or inter time frame for perfusion sequences available as a drop in step? Uh, we, we, I mean, Fabio, you can correct me, right? But uh, what we have there is different libraries for doing registration. And we can share with you code that we have on how, how we do registration, right? And um, you can call them automatically. Mm -hmm. But they, they can be available, yeah. Fabio. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Fabio. You can use also the audio if you prefer, huh? because the only problem is when, okay. So... Fabio, there will, be, uh, there will be no problem there. We would install the software that you need as long as it can run in, in for example, in, in CentOS or in Linux, we would have to take a look at it. Uh, the code will be a little more complex, for example, for FSL, uh, depending on how you, on the programming language that you are going to use, for example, you might call uh, a, virtual, a virtual machine with, with FSL from MATLAB, we will have to, to take a look at it because our, our, uh, uh, our MATLAB license is in, is in Windows. We are using it in a Windows machine, but we can call FSL to a different machine uh, with no problem from the Windows machine. And of course, Elastics, there's no problem there at all. We use Elastics in, in a lot of our algorithms, so, so there's no problem there. Or whatever motion correction libraries, co-registration libraries. Uh, so there's actually no, not a lot of problems there. It's just a matter of taking a look at each software that you want to, to include.
Oh iya. You can by the moment we will have our orientation pattern for business by now, but we will have the opportunity to implement it for us now. Or if you have a more time to implement it, I think that maybe you have the person needs to can even work in a collaboration to develop a technology with you. Yeah, we should check if you. We should check if there if there is any challenge that mm -hmm. already has uh, kidney segmented. If if there is not, um, probably we, we can. One of these projects can be kidney segmentation, no? And uh, we can, let's say, we can take, for example, a group of kidneys and perform the segmentations between two or three groups just to have you know different masks, no? Because one of the problems would be the label data sets. When we have the label data sets, we are quite fast on, on training and, and creating a new or deploying a new algorithm for kidney segmentation in this case. We will have we will have a look huh, if there is anyone, no? Any 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 data set of kidney. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anna is mentioning that uh, but not in a month. Uh, well, thanks for the questions because it's great to have your feedback. Um, are there more questions around? I think we we have been discussing on the pre-processing, right? For on the images preparation, and there we we are used to work in the segmentation part. In the registration, one of the main tools is uh, Elastics for sure, and we are quite used to that. Then uh, even well, registration even if it's intra sequence like. Uh, across different B values or intersequence, no? Uh, because, for example, the question from, from uh, India that was coming was related to the multivariate analysis, no? If we register the perfusion and the diffusion. Uh, then regarding the integration, no? Susmita was asking also about um, if we have an updated manual, and uh, since, for example, this GitHub feature is quite recent, it's from, from this uh, last week, uh, we think that we will update the, the you know, code feature using uh, GitHub. I would like to, to mention that this improvement of the integration of the code with uh, GitHub is already an output of the previous workshop we did with Felix here. I mean, uh, Felix Navarro, who is a researcher from Parenchima, uh, was with us during a week. And one of his comments and one of his feedbacks was, why, uh, well, why do not you make the code uploading uh, easier? Because until now, what you have to do is you have to take either the, the uh, exec file or the code and to integrate it inside the server in a specific folder. And it was quite intricate. And we decided to take this feedback 
and to just to link the code with the corresponding GitHub repository. So I guess that obviously this is a progress of the previous workshop, but probably if we have ideas also from you, we can customize the platform to your to your needs. No, for example, the the comment of Susmita, I think it's highly positive. No, why don't you create a package there of of the useful files? No, that you can download. For example, the skeleton of the algorithm in MATLAB, the also the preparation uh, of the registration or the different codes that we use to convert from one format to the other. No? So I think this is feedback that we are using to improve the tool. Are there additional questions? Let's have a look on the attendees. Okay, we have uh, Susmita, we have Stefan, Pietro, Paul, Murali, Maduri, Kabir is there also. Hi, Kabir. And uh, Fabio Neri and Dr. Bassan. No? Um, uh, Angel, um, this is from the user side. I I was trying to upload. Maybe uh, I I could discuss this later with you. I, I was trying to upload images yesterday. And uh, it did not finish. It, it it was stuck there for a long time, so I cancelled. Um, maybe this is a technical issue. I have to. Uh, so, and I did not uh, choose only the separate out the DICOM files. So maybe it could be a reason it did not go in. And also, I I have uploaded data before um, successfully but i cannot see them now uh do you know why it i mean i see the tags the cases the subjects are there but the data is not there anymore the images i mean so i mean why i cannot hear you sorry Can you hear us, Susmita? Yeah, now yes, but uh, Fabio, I don't hear. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Uh, not really, not clear. Okay, maybe a little bit louder. No. Can you hear us now, Susmita? Yes, yeah, yeah. When you speak, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I was explaining that uh, we were deploying the platform yesterday. We had uh, some some deployment issues, and we have to deploy many times. So maybe we we deploy at the same time. You were uploading images. Sorry for the issue. Um, we will we'll check the store to see okay, okay. what has happened, if the files are, are uploaded and the database. But okay. today it has worked fine. So okay, okay. to be able to upload today. OK, OK. And what about the previously uploaded images? Uh, they will come back or? or I, will uh, check. I will check it. OK, OK, OK. Thank you. They will. If you have some studies in the past, uh, we will restore it. Okay, okay. That will be great, yeah. Hey, hi, Fabio. Uh, the, the, the only download uh, results that the platform uh, can offer to, for downloading right now at the image, so the, the, those parametric maps in, in image format, for example, in JPG. Uh, but uh, we will also, we uh, since uh, we are letting the user download the, the structure, you know, from the the user, no, the developer, uh, from the 
from the upload studies, we will also take a look, uh, for example, if you generate extra results and store it in, in the results folder, you will be also be able to download those nifty files and, and, and stuff. So yes, uh, uh, summarizing, you will be able to download those, those nifty files if you create them. If you create, uh, for example, a binary mask uh, during your code or, or a, corre a corregister volume, you will be able to download them. Yeah. So any more questions? the the features to to improve the functionalities of the of the platform according to to your ideas no i think we have we have time till 12 if you have more questions Probably um, one thing we have not discussed now is the, I mean, the platform will be uh, continuously improving, no? Because, um, for example, now we are working with the University of Constance in the development of an improved data miner environment. So here. For example, if you go to the data miner, for example, I can show you the data miner environment that we have. Obviously, it has sense to have a data miner when you have data, right? If not, there is nothing to mine. So this is the example of, of Quibim. This is the general platform. Okay, of the of the company, and uh, here, for example, we have uh, in in our user several studies analyzed. So, for example, if I go to the data miner of all the studies I I already analyzed, I can choose, for example. I mean, this is an example of, of cases with uh, white matter lesions, right? So, for example, I can filter the age, and then I can I can go here and I can say, okay, let's plot the age, and uh, what about the lesion number in in patients with the age, right? And then I can have this kind of tendencies, and here. You can download all the table right in an excel file so this is very useful because uh, you can perform quick research you can very fast download all the data and uh, go for an abstract go for a paper or whatever okay for example here you can see that we already have all the data in an excel file and this can be imported in any statistical packets right uh, well we have a question from paul uh, speaking about the intention for cloud or local implementation ah yes uh, you are speaking about the whether we install uh, local solutions or cloud uh, most of our collaborators, uh, specifically 70, 75% of collaborators work with the cloud solution and uh, 25 are working with uh, local installation in, in hospitals, right? Um, for hospitals, what we have is these hospitals that want to connect to cloud. We have a post in our blog uh, speaking about this issue. For example, here if we go, oh, this is our blog. I, I invite you also to, to visit it if you want to make any, any comment. And uh, I think, 
Okay. Let me go to previous publications. It's the, we call it the MIUC. Okay, this one. This is the medical imaging universal connector we deployed, and it's a toolkit uh, that uh, connects the local site in the hospital. You can see here that we have the modalities, we have the packs, and we have the workstations in the packs. And then uh, if a hospital wants to push data to the cloud, what we do is we install a software here it's called a medical imaging universal connector, as I mentioned. And then what this uh, module does is dissociates the data. And we ensure and we guarantee that uh, all the data traveling to the cloud, especially this is a concern of the hospital, all the data traveling to the cloud is uh, dissociated. And therefore we receive the study anonymized. We an analyze it using the specific tools. And then the results go back again uh, back to the hospital, right? So these reports are kind of re-associated to the patient data and get integrated with the PACS. Uh, it is important to know that the user can access also from, from you know, anywhere using the internet, but when the user access through web, for example, through internet to the platform, the user is accessing Quibin Precision. So all the data that the user will see is dissociated and anonymized. So from the internet side, there is no way to, to link the data unless uh, you know and you belong to the same center uh, to, the, to the patient data, right? So this is more or less how we, how we solve this uh, connection between both sides. And the infrastructure that is needed is mainly a server here where we can install Kibin Precision Platform, right? If uh, the focus is only to install the MIUC, I mean, the, the installation is very uh, easy. It's, I mean, it's, it's not heavy at all. And it only requires a standard uh, machine. It can be in any, you know, any computer that the department has can be used to perform this uh, routing and dissociation of cases. Because in the end, what is embedded here is a DICOM anonymizer and a DICOM router also uh, sending case, well, um, giving developed DICOM router to send the cases through, through cloud, right? And uh, apart from that, if we want to integrate the whole solution inside the hospital, then we need an infrastructure, then we need uh, computing machines, then we need a server, and we need a similar infrastructure to the one we have in, um, in Microsoft Azure, right? Which is uh, this one. This one is the architecture we have nowadays in Microsoft. And as you can see, sorry, this is the upcoming architecture. This is the current architecture. As you can see, oh, sorry. As you can see, we have uh, different machines for the for the web server and for the storage, mainly working in Azure storage. And we have additional machines for Python, MATLAB, uh, FSL, FreeSurfer, and also an additional machine for the database. No. So we can replicate uh, this structure in any hospital or center. Yeah, we can we can do that also. But obviously, it depends on the on the hospital type, no? But as I was mentioning, most of them, 75%, prefer to to use the cloud solution, right? Mm -hmm. Are there um, more questions in the audience?
Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, finalize now the, the webinar. I think we are one hour ahead of schedule, right? Because we didn't know uh, what would be more or less the speed and the questions. So we just programmed uh, one additional hour because of, of you know, a uh, uh, hot discussion. But I think that also the number of attendees is uh, appropriate for what we did today. And uh, do not forget that we are recording this webinar. And what we will do is we will uh, put uh, the video of the whole webinar in the Parenchima Working Group 2 uh, webpage. And uh, this is a petition also of a lot of researchers that couldn't be with us today. And they, they were asking for the webinar to be recorded. We will, uh, we will do that. We will uh, just uh, save all the webinar probably in an MP4 file and we will upload it to, to the Parenchima webpage. Okay. Well, I don't know whether there is any final comment. If not, uh, I would say a big thanks to all of you. A big thanks also to Keeping Team for the presentation and the demos and um, this. And a big thanks, big, big thanks to the whole Parenchima Consortium no? for uh, thinking in Keeping as the research platform to integrate the cases and the algorithms. We will be uh, probably in the next uh, consortium meeting in Prague. We are really looking forward to it. And uh, we are very happy to, to be part of this big project. So thank you and uh, have a nice end of July and August if you are taking vacation. Thank you. Thank you very much.